need to start with an announcement um, uh, after my uh, after taking a moment like everyone else to say thank you for the um, honor to be in this space. I am absolutely humbled. My announcement is that I'm the academic program chair for ASALH in 2012. And the Black History Month theme is black women in American history and culture. So I am, I am uh, submitting an open call for a continuation of this conversation because as I said, I'm the academic program chair. So I hope to see a continuation of these papers and discussion. Uh, my paper today is called My Passport Made Me Persona Non Grata. Insubordination, Quest, and Voice in Black Women's Study Abroad Memoirs. And I believe you all have handouts with the slides. Of the hundreds of African American women who have penned autobiographies, at least 10 offer global memoirs of study abroad. Trips were made by Mary Church Terrell to Europe, Anna Julia Cooper to Paris, Catherine Dunham to Haiti, Zora Neale Hurston to Jamaica and Haiti, um, Colleen McElroy to Germany, Marion Wright Edelman to Paris, Lena Morton to England, Angela Davis also to Paris, Gail Pemberton to England, and Jan Willis to Tibet. I argue these 10 women, five living and five ancestors who studied abroad between 1884 and 1967 provide roadmaps to self-efficacy for today's youth. In historic scholarly circles, as today, Mary McLeod Bethune may not be the first person we think of when considering black women's intellectual history. Yet, after listening to the panels of these past two days and rethinking what I hope to bring to the table with this paper, it is Bethune's legacy that is most uniquely qualified to offer theoretical explanation of my work. In addition to Hurston calling Bethune a heifer and a crusher of talent in 1937, as Professor Alexander pointed out last night, Hurston and women like Mary Church Terrell also indicated that Bethune was not capable of doing intellectual work and she was not respected for her ideas. I call Bethune's name at this intellectual history conference for it was Bethune who asked at a Hampton University address in 1934, where are the interpreters to translate scholarship into the language of the street? <coughs> when constructing this paper, a large part of my focus was how black women's writing may be used in present day educational settings particularly at the high school and introductory college level. This project is in the very beginning stages, and basically I've been collecting data for a year, um, of a long research process that will necessarily involve analysis of dissertations, primary papers, and publications, most notably by, by Farrah Griffin, uh, Joanne Braxton, Margot Perkins, uh, jo uh, Joyce West Stevens, and Carolyn Tucker. But when completing this conference paper, uh, I focused on the discourse of the authors and had a subconscious impulse to translate my scholarship into media and medium accessible to younger community beyond, beyond the walls of academe. I will return to this point after a brief introduction of the 10 women at hand. In her 1969 Island Possessed, published 10 years after her initial autobiography, A Touch of Innocence, Catherine Dunham wrote about her research trip to Haiti in 1935 by saying, quote, my passport would make me to some degree persona non grata. I counted on color to offset this, but then there was to offset that, my sex and class, the student class, very hard to place. As the situation presented itself, I seemed to have wavered or capitulated from mulatto to black, elite to, to peasant, intellectual to bohemian, in to out, up to down, and tried hard to keep out of trouble, but did not succeed. As Heather Williams noted in Self-Taught African American Education and Slavery and Freedom, North Carolina travel restrictions on anti-literacy laws in the 1830s were constructed to keep blacks in, quote, due subordination. Thus, black women's study abroad begins with Dunham's recognition of the student class as being inherently insubordinate because they are hard to place. Insubordination is useful for understanding self-efficacy, which I define as the collective three themes of insubordination, quest, and voice. This triad is reflected in a classic axiom of mother wit. Specifically, Ohio State Senator Nina Turner's grandmother told her, there are three things you need to be successful in life, a backbone, a wishbone, and a jawbone. Use your backbone for perseverance, your wishbone for goal setting, and your jawbone for speaking out. I argue black women's study abroad memoir, a willful act of 
of self-education and auto-narrative exemplify backbone, wishbone, and jawbone as maps of self-efficacy desperately needed for the next generation of scholars. Backbone, insubordination, and self-possession. Catherine, and so what I've done is separate these three, these 10 women into the three categories that I uh, observed their writing represents. Catherine Dunham traveled to the Caribbean in 1936, after which she visited 57 countries in 20 years. From her narrative, um, the act of self-creation in Island Possessed traced Dunham's concept of humanization of blackness as she embraced Haitian culture in her body, creating dance. Angela Davis studied abroad in 1963 in Paris while, her while in her third year at Brandeis University. She continued to study in 1965 to 1967 in East Berlin and Humboldt University to earn her MA and PhD, although she earned her PhD actually in California. Um, her travel and study memoirs are, are recorded in Autobiography in 1974, and she identifies political philosophy and critical theory as the basis of her activism in the black power movement. The third person um, for self-creation is Jan Willis, studied in Tibet during a summer program in 1967 while at Cornell University. In Dreaming Me, Black, Baptist, and Buddhist, published in 2008, she chronicled visiting Tibet and Nepal uh, in 1969. Her curriculum of Hindi philosophy, poetry, and music in secluded shrines and temples. In contrast to Davis's political philosophy, as ontological grounding, Willis employed religious philosophy as the basis of her identity and framework for her nonviolent practice in education. Wishbone, or self-determination and quest. Mary Church Terrell's 1884 to 86 trip in Europe was one of the earliest known black women study abroad reflections and it was recorded in her 1940 autobiography, A Colored Woman in a Black World. Terrell, an Oberlin graduate, studied in France, Germany, Italy, Switzerland, and England after graduation. As Brittany Cooper's research has highlighted uh, here at this conference, Terrell also traveled to participate in international activism around peace and women's rights in 1904 and 1919. Terrell's depiction of her treatment in a rooming house by two Massachusetts students who wanted to get her thrown out because she was black while she was in Germany, right? Uh, reflects early origins of her demand for equal treatment, for creating space. Lena Morton used similar tactics as Terrell, employing her record of the hospitality of Europeans to shame Americans. Uh, Morton did not study while at uh, a student at the University of Cincinnati or while at Western Reserve where she earned her PhD in English in 1947. Rather, she attended a summer session at the University of London in 1956 after graduation. Her autobiography, My First 60 Years, Passion for Wisdom, published in 1965, details her travel to England, France, Scotland, Switzerland, in addition to her literature and art in England, 1750 to 1850, uh, which she took, a, that was her summer course uh, in England. Again, which she touted the civilization of the Scottish people, the civilization of the English people in contrast with America. Marion Wright Edelman studied abroad in 1959 while a student at <coughs> Stelman College. Um, her summer long trip included visits to Ireland, Scotland, and the Soviet Union. And the account is included in a chapter entitled Europe in Lanterns, a memoir of mentors published in 99. Uh, reflection of her newfound freedom of adulthood status and freedom from Stelman, um, and it uh, was, which she cites as it's preparing her for the civil rights struggles at home. So it was what she learned abroad that prepared her to return home, uh, to create that space there. Jawbone, self-definition or voice. One of the most well-known accounts of study abroad is, of course, Anna Julia Cooper, who defined herself by choosing the word esclavage, slavery, as the first word of her dissertation. In the third step, uh, published in 1945, she discusses her experiences uh, in creating the dissertation and defending the dissertation with triumphant Im imagery because the writing process represented literal, literary freedom, most significant for someone who was born into a U.S. legacy of limited learning opportunities of Reconstruction and Jane Crow. Anthropologist Zora Neale Hurston recorded her research observations in Tell My Horse and a patchwork reflection uh, which appears in a Dust Tracks on the Road in 1942. Hurston is distinct from Dunham because, because Dunham's autobiographical reflection focuses on her own transformations in her body, but Hurston's voice operates primarily as a folklorist, 
conveying communal experiences of cultural formation and transformation. Gail Pemberton's 1965 study in England is recorded in The Hottest Water in Chicago in 1992. Like Hurston, Pemberton locates her voice within a family or communal culture, particularly viewing her autobiography as an extension of her father's beginnings at Write and Run. Pemberton stands out because she traveled as a high school student. Lastly, Colleen McElroy began as a study abroad student in 1953 to Munich, Germany, and developed her work as a scholar, uh, as a scholar traveler uh, through uh, uh, Fulbright and Rockefeller fellowships in the 1970s and 1980s. She ventured to Mexico, Peru, Yugoslavia, Malaysia, Yucatan, Belize, Japan, Fiji, and Australia. Her lyrical travelogue is recorded in A Long Way from St. Louis, published in 1997, and is written as a collection of sketches of vignettes, often utilizing concrete or shaped poetry as much as a chronological account of her travel. With the exception of two chas chapters, the whole book chronicles travel, making her articulation of a stable black womanhood within a wide array of national contexts a compelling manifesto. <coughs> um, these are the narratives of backbone, wishbone, and jawbone, which offer promising paradigms for global competency, psychological scaffolding, and critical spiritual sustenance. As a group, they underscore the importance of survey history. Black <coughs> women's history is a constellation, neither a single star nor a master narrative, which allows for comparative analysis that brings out the diversity within black women's experiences, perceptions, and ideas. For example, it's very interesting to note um, the difference between Angela Davis's interpretation of the meaning of her travel and Jan Willis's interpretation of the meaning in her travel. Both were traveling during the black power movement, but Angela Davis saw that her study abroad compelled and prepared her to go back for the fight. And Jan Willis was actually at Cornell when the blow up was happening and said she had to choose between uh, the Buddhist philosophy and black power movement. So how they saw travel was very different, but that can only be captured <coughs> when doing a broader comparative uh, perspective rather than one, one person. In Black Women in the Ivory Tower, 1850-1954, in Intellectual History, I presented a living legacy of black women's ideas regarding four goals of higher education. Demand for applied learning, recognition of the import of importance of uh, social standpoint theory and cultural identity and scholarship, a critical epistemology that both supported and resisted mainstream American ideals, and moral existentialism grounded in a sense of communal responsibility. Cooper is often invoked as an intellectual. Bethune is not. But when writing this essay in the spirit of Bethune's call for translation, that is application, my attention went primarily to producing cultural uh, curricular materials about this group of women who studied abroad. After <coughs> 10 years of teaching a class called Mentoring At-Risk Youth, I am conditioned to automatically identify useful messages in historical contexts. So when writing this paper, I found it natural to compile a larger scope of 130 black autobiographers, which you can see that, <coughs> that uh, big list on the, the flyer. That's what that is, contextualizing these. Uh, it's taken me a year to collect these books, but I felt like I couldn't tell the story of study abroad until I knew the broader picture of black women's inter, uh, international, or black women's, and then of course black men's international travel. Um, who, uh, those 130 black autobiographers who traveled internationally um, and place that mosaic, with it, mosaic uh, place that information within an easily digestible photo mosaic and bibliographic list. I do a lot of workshops with high school students and I'm doing some this summer. So in preparing for this conference, I saw this as an opportunity to prepare that you know, photo list and things like that. I mined the six of the travel memoirs to create a 725 word quest vocabulary that can be incorporated into studying for the FCAT or the GRE standardized test. So I'm going through these books and picking out words because when studying for the SAT or the GRE, it was really difficult for me to focus on random words. Here, I'm going to submit this quest vocabulary to some of the girls that I work with to say, you construct your story from the narratives that black women before you have constructed. <coughs> and I made a YouTube video that is now available online under the heading Black Passports. 
with the music by, of course, Erica Badu, Window Seat, and Bob Marley's Exodus, that ties historic travel abroad with the three African American and African American Written Paris trips, spring break courses that I've taught. Um, I get a lot of flack for my website because it, there's there's a lot of information on there, and I'm always directing people to professorevans.com. But I do that because it is a resource site. I use that for teaching in elementary schools and churches and all of that. So creating the videos, because you know my daddy's not going to read my book. There's a lot of people who are not going to read my book, but I want to make sure the message gets out. So I created this uh, link <coughs> to say that the, the reason there's no end date on my title is because black women are still studying abroad. I've taken 40 students in three years over to Paris, so I link that in the video. And so if you just go to YouTube and, and look for black passports, you'll see the video that I created from, uh, from this paper. I too thank the conveners of this conference because I listened to panelists in this sacred place help me better understand and interpret my actions that would have otherwise gone gone unanalyzed. I look forward to suggestions about how to develop this new area of study and discussions around the curricular uh, applications uh, of this in, in the future. <coughs> Thank you. I just want to echo the many thanks to the, to the organizers and conveners of this conference. It's been an incredible um, and fruitful three days, and those of us who are presenting today have the benefit of being able to reference some of what we've already heard. Um, this is, what I'm gonna be talking about today is part of a dissertation in progress on black archival practice from the 19 teens through the 1950s. Um, maybe a, a yet another version of the uh, prehistory of African American studies that we heard about so powerfully last night. And I don't usually think about my work in terms of the history of education, um, but I suppose it is fundamentally about education, although not always in its academic sense. So I'm gonna be talking today about the librarian and collector Vivian Harsh and the special Negro collection that she built in Chicago from 1932 to 1958. For many of you, the name Vivian Harsh will sound quite familiar from the Vivian G. Harsh Research Collection of Afro-American History at the Chicago Public Library with uh, which along with the Schomburg Center and Moreland Spingarn is one of the preeminent sites in the US for conducting black research. But the figure of Harsh herself may not be as familiar to you. She's another one of those elusive figures of intellectual history that we've all been puzzling over at this conference. So to begin, I direct your attention to the, to the photograph um, that's on your table that circulated. Um, this is a 1932 photograph of the 12 women who comprised the founding staff of the George Cleveland Hall Branch Library on Chicago's South Side, which was the first branch library in Chicago uh, to serve a predominantly black neighborhood. Behind these women stand bookshelves holding the small nucleus of what would eventually make this library <coughs> famous, the special Negro collection that Vivian Harsh, who is seated at the desk in the center, um, created and built during her 26 years as head of the Hall Branch Library. But I, the reason I wanted to circulate the image is so that you could note how they present themselves. Not a single one of them is looking at the camera. The obliqueness of their poses, um, how they you know, position themselves as poised and bookish, and yet they seem to so acutely avoid being objects of attention, echoes the peripheral way they've been recollected in intellectual history. Although both contemporary commentators and subsequent historians hailed the Special Negro Collection as the Midwest's <coughs> finest collection of books by and about Negroes, and celebrated the library as a Chicago Renaissance space that was frequented by the likes of Langston Hughes, Arna Bontemps, Richard Wright, the young Gwendolyn Brooks, and so on, the women who created and presided over the space tend to appear as ancillary characters. They're remembered more for their personalities um, or as neighborhood fixtures um, than for their intellectual work. So Hughes, for example, described librarians as those very nice women who help you find wonderful books. And he lauded the Hall Branch Library, whose Negro book collection is excellent and whose librarians are charming. In such accounts, these women seem to have kept watch without really shaping the intellectual life that unfolded in and around the collections they built. Like their understated presence in that photograph, Harsh and her colleagues have garnered commendation, but not critical examination. This approach, I would argue, results in part from the non-traditional paper trail they produced. 
Most of these women, including Vivian Harsh, left behind no monograph, no manifesto, <coughs> no autobiography, not even really a cache of letters or a set of articles that we can read. Reflecting this absence of written sources, the Chicago Defender described Harsh upon her death in 1960 as a brilliant historian who never wrote. And that characterization has been echoed since then um, by scholars and, and, and other profilers. My question, however, is what would happen if we did consider someone like Vivian Harsh as a key shaper of African American thought in the mid-20th century? What if we actually took seriously her collecting and classification work as the construction of an archive that fostered emergent epistemologies of blackness in the period? Such a recentering, I think, would provoke several reformulations. First, it calls into question the idea of Harsh as a non-writer. For when one examines her records, it becomes clear that Harsh actually wrote constantly. But her output took the form of bibliographies, reading lists, book reviews, and card catalogs, all examples of genres that confound conventional sources and methods for writing intellectual history. How does one read a bibliography, for example, when it appears to be little more than a list? Bureaucratic in form and often covert in viewpoint, Bibliographies are, doc are documents about reading, but they're not necessarily documents that seem to want to be read. Um, they're documents for the extraction of information rather than for analysis, or that's what they, they seem to be. What makes such documents challenging to interpret, however, is precisely what I think also makes them productive for new ways of thinking about the history of ideas. Like other editorial genres, anthologies, for example, Bibliographies reflect political, practical, and theoretical decisions about how to draw the boundaries of categories like black literature and black history, race, and nation. The frequent anonymity of these texts, furthermore, in this case often issued not under Harsh's name, but under the authorship of the Hall Branch Library, raises key questions about the collective nature and gendered politics of knowledge production. A key component of my longer paper, then, entails experimenting with the kinds of documents that Harsh and other collectors produced and using them to rethink the practices of theorizing blackness in this period. The particular materiality of Harsh's bibliographies, which were printed in mimeograph form for local circulation, excerpted in black newspapers, and often composed in collaboration, focuses attention on how these texts were used by a wide range of those thinkers that Elizabeth McHenry has called forgotten readers. Several important, if little known, organizations and projects made their home at the Hall Branch Library and operated in close relationship to Harsh's collection from the 1930s to 50s, uh, including the Book Review and Lecture Forum, the DuSable History Club, the Illinois Writers Project, and the committee that wrote the first district-wide Negro history curriculum for the Chicago Public Schools. So what Harsh and her colleagues created was not just a storehouse of research materials, but also what someone at the time called an intelligence center. In the longer paper, I talk about how Harsh's bibliographic work was imbricated with these community-based study groups. I argue that to understand someone like Harsh as a public thinker, someone who shaped an intellectual community and its reading habits without producing extensive texts of her own, we have to think in terms of both materiality and sociality. There's a benefit to the amount of archival digging and contextualization necessary to study a hidden thinker like Harsh. It productively challenges our sense of intellectual authorship. We're forced to see how her text emerged through social and organizational practice. And thus, in the process, we have to acknowledge other non-writers, quote unquote, who alongside Harsh shaped public debates about race and diaspora. Had Harsh authored more traditional intellectual texts, we might not have to think about, and thus might continue to obscure from view those figures like the high school teachers, George Dorsey and Samuel Stratton, the postal workers, Ethel Wycliffe and Theodore Crawley, the waiter, George Sanford, and the actress and teacher, Brunetta Muzon, to name a few examples, all of whom collaborated with Harsh as planners, <coughs> lecturers, and reviewers for the Book Review and Lecture Forum or the DuSable History Club. In other words, perhaps the difficulties of studying someone like Harsh actually provide a way of, for us to think about how we might do intellectual history more generally, even when we do have more readable sources. The Special Negro Collection called into being collectivities 
that speak to a more complicated picture of intellectual history than one that hews to a divide between written and vernacular expression or between those who did and did not engage with print culture. Harsh and her collaborators did not indeed write in the sense of traditional intellectual genres. Still, their work as both collectors and conveners crucially shaped black thought in Chicago in the 20th century by amassing and giving meaning to a body of sources, by creating an early infrastructure for the popular study of black history and literature, and by generating the conditions of possibility in both material and ideological ways for emergent visions of blackness in later periods. And in fact, when you look at the organizational and bibliographic infrastructure um, that was built in Chicago in the 1930s through 50s, uh, it can also help us reframe the periodization of black history. Both Harsh's collection itself and some of the figures uh, who worked closely with her to build local intellectual organizations like the high school teacher Samuel Stratton forged concrete links between the Negro history movement of the 1920s and 30s and the emergence of black studies uh, in the late 1960s and 70s. Thanks. Good afternoon. I too would like to express my enormous thanks and appreciation for being included in this incredible conference. It's just such a, a real delight to be able to be amongst all of these wonderful scholars. Um, the uh, work I'm going to present to you this afternoon is a part of a larger study that I've been working on probably a lifetime. Um, I, um, my work really is in the history of women's higher education, and, and my earliest work has really looked at uh, black women in white institutions. And having worked and been in uh, women's studies programs, predominantly white, obviously, uh, and studying the history of women's higher education, there's a narrative in women's his educational history that talks about, uh, and rightfully so, if you, particularly if you look at white women, you know, the whole binary between single sex and co-education, that whole argument, and also um, access to certain disciplines, and also the utility of the degree after college, what is a big theme in white women's higher education. But as a product of two black colleges, you know, none of this was, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know any of this because it didn't reflect my reality because I saw lots of black women faculty you can major in anything. Uh, in many colleges, black women dominated, you know, when I was in college. So that was my perspective. So I spent most of my time, you know, writing about black women in white institutions. But, and, and Farrah would know, this is when I met her, I did a postdoc at Radcliffe uh, in the late 70s. And there was a project being completed at Radcliffe, the Black Women's Oral History Project. And they interviewed 72 black women and as it turns out, because I was there, uh, they had completed pretty much uh, all of the interviews and they were doing this transcript, but they asked me to write the introduction to the volume that they did called Women of Courage. And as a result, I had an opportunity to read all of these oral histories. Huge number of women were black college presidents, not presidents, faculty. Um, and as it turns out, Dorothy Porter, who was on the advisory board of the Radcliffe Project, was from Howard. Um, and so almost every black woman at Howard was in this study, you know, in the oral history. So, I mean, it was like at least 10. Uh, and so it was just very interesting reading their uh, oral histories. Um, and so that just took me off on a whole nother tangent, you know, and reading these um, oral histories, uh, which I want to say a little about. But then it also, I, a lot happened at Howard, you know, because Howard was the capstone, it was the university. Uh, and I did this piece on Lucy Diggs Slow later, who was the first black woman dean at, at Howard. And as a result of doing the work on Slow, I interviewed a lot of her former students, uh, and this is back in the 80s, this is long, long ago, um, who also became deans of women, and they all ended up coming to Teachers College and getting a degree um, in higher ed and in student personnel. Uh, and so all of these women taught at black, well, worked at black colleges. Well, they taught and were mm -hmm. administrators. And so you keep hearing all these different stories about the black college experience. And then they started the National Association of Coll College Women. And then it was another organization that was started on the National Association looking at um, uh, deans and counselors of Negro uh, women in co black colleges. And so their, all their papers are at Howard. And as you really look at 
their enormous concern about what was happening with black women students. And so I've written about that. But now I've become very interested in their experiences as faculty because I, and also I did a piece, you know, because so much stuff comes out of these materials, so many different things on uh, black academic couples. Because another thing in, in white women's, you know, the whole thing about nepotism, you can't ever find a job because you're a husband. But that wasn't the case in black colleges <laughs> at all. And I mean, like at all, there were like 17 couples. I mean, I mean, in lots of them. I mean, and then so that existed back then. And so I wrote about that. That was really kind of interesting too. So I interviewed people about that as well. But of course, the women said, you know, the women got paid less, but that's the, the constant theme. But you know, you in the same location and you build a life in an institution and uh, you, you make an enormous contribution in, in those kinds of things. But anyway, that's sort of an aside. So this is sort of how I got involved in this work. And so what I'm looking at is looking at the, part of the question is how difficult it would be for um, these women to find jobs. And that was not the case. In fact, uh, when I was at, years ago, looking, I was in the Fisk archives uh, and Charles S. Johnson, he was the first black president of Fisk, and he did this book in the 30s, The Negro College Graduate. And I was looking at this survey of Anna Julia Cooper, and one of the questions it said was, time from degree to finding a job. And she said, not a moment. You know, and it was like, <laughs> <laughs> instantly, you know, so I went to work instantly. So the jobs were there. You know, it's just that they didn't pay much, but you know, you could find a job. Um, so anyway, um, while the names of prominent black male scholars such as Elaine Locke, Sterling Brown, John Ho Franklin, Benjamin Mays, Howard Thurman, Ernest Just, E. Franklin Frazier, Rayford Logan, Ralph Bunch, Frank Snowden, Charles Hamilton Houston, who taught at Howard, are uh, well known. Little is known of the equally impressive list of black women faculty who also joined the faculty immediately after Mordecai Johnson became president, who was the first black president of um, Howard University. Um, uh, there were a number of, uh, some of these women uh, were, the three black women earned, the first three black women to get PhDs were in 1921. Eva Dykes uh, from Radcliffe, Georgiana Simpson in Germanic languages from Chicago, and Sadie Taylor Alexander in economics, uh, who didn't become an, all three of them were offered jobs at Howard, you know, uh, and uh, Georgiana Simpson and Eva Dykes actually did teach at Howard. Uh, as I said, Alexander didn't become an academic. Dorothy Fairby was the first black woman to graduate from Tufts Medical School in 1924. She joined Howard Medical School faculty in 1930 and remained till 1968. She was the director of the Howard Medical Center from 1949 to 68. And I'm just gonna go through these quickly and then I'll come back to them. Dorothy Porter Wesley, was a 28 alumna of Howard and the first black woman to get a master's in library science from Columbia in 1932. She was appointed to Howard's faculty and staff in 32 to establish the special collection and worked in the Moreland Spring Art collection. Uh, and she remained till 1975. Annabeth Lindsay was a 1920 alumna of Howard and she earned a master's in social work from Chicago in 37, returned to Howard on the faculty in the same year in 45, she became the Dean of the School of Social Work, a position that she held until 1968. Uh, Fleming Kittrell, and all of these people have a little history, a part of this Black Women's Oral History Project. Uh, Fleming Kittrell was the first black woman to earn a PhD in the field of nutrition uh, at Cornell in 38. And she joined the faculty at Howard in 44 and stayed, she was the founding Dean of the School of Home Economics. Uh, and she remained until she retired in 72. And Merz Tate, who I'll say more about because there's a couple of people who are doing work on her and she is a very interesting person, was the first black woman to earn a degree from Oxford University in England with a bachelor's in literature in 1935, the first black woman to earn a PhD from Harvard uh, in government and interna international relations in 41. And she taught at Howard from 45 and she was one of two women hired in the history department. She remained until 1977. So we know about all of these other guys who have these equally, but these women's credentials are toe to toe with these men. Um, but you don't know about them at all and um, uh, know very little. 
these women, uh, another thing that's really interesting looking at these women mm -hmm. was their connections they had with other women faculty across the black college um, community. And they were also very active in national organization. Dorothy Fairby was the um, Bass was president of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, which was founded at H Howard. Uh, and so was Lucy Slow. She was a founding member of Alpha Kappa Alpha. And, uh, and also, Fira B was the president of the National um, uh, what's his name? Oh, I'm Council, blind. Of Council of Negro Women. Women. Right, right, thank you. And so she was involved in all kinds of things. In addition to the work and being a physician and being over this thing, she was involved with all kinds of uh, philanthropic and um, community-based organizations and activities. Uh, this organization established a faculty, women's faculty club in 1940. But it was also interesting the year before there was a club called the Faculty Wives Clubs as well, and it sort of overlapped. Oh, goodness. Well, all right, so um, let me just quickly say something about Murs Tate, uh, and then I'll conclude. Um, Murs Tate, as I said, joined the faculty in 45, and she was one of two women. And I spoke to Murs Tate years ago in the 80s uh, after she had retired, and she talked to me about, you know, how horrible Howard was and how the women were underpaid. And, she couldn't, uh, you know, the men always got the summer school appointments to make extra money. Women were totally out of that. Uh, and how they couldn't get an AAUP chapter because, because of the lack, the women were so poorly um, paid and they didn't have any uh, status that they couldn't even get a chapter. And she sent some me some documents about that. Um, I really don't have time because I only have two minutes to talk about a uh, uh, confrontation at, um, Tate had with Rafa Logan, who was the chair of the history department, who also was a Harvard graduate. And in his diary, he talks about her confronting him about not being able to teach summer school. And he, you know, he said, you know, he he was shocked to say because she said she thought it was because of her gender. And he said that wasn't it. Um, and um, and I don't have this in my paper, but in in his diary, he talks about how he said, oh well, you know, Tate taught diplomatic history, and we don't need that in the summer. We only need like American history. We don't need the graduate courses, just this. And she said, well, I can teach American history. And John Hope Franklin was on the faculty then, and he said, well, something to the effect that you're not qualified. And so that, she blew up. And she said, you know, I went to Harvard just like you went to Harvard. I took the same exams you did, and one of my areas of concentration is American history. So it was just really a very big uh, blow up. Um, and uh, which resulted in her, uh, you know, Rafa Logan saying, that, you know, she would have to move out of the office and all this because they just could not get along. And they shared offices. I mean, uh, the thing about being in Howard, you know, even being a department chair, I mean, who got a telephone was a big deal, who got an office. So anyway, she shared an office with him, but she refused to take his messages. And she would just, <laughs> she would say, you know, when people call, she would say, I'm not his secretary. <laughs> you know, and so you have to call back. And so, but anyway, this is a work in process. And, um, and I'm, it's just, it's very interesting. The Howard situation is very interesting. But the thank you so much. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, everyone. Again, I'd like to reiterate what the panel was saying, how excited I am to be here. When I first got the email that I'd been accepted, I was at the Schomburg Conference, and Malinga Karinga was speaking, so I wanted to go, yay, but it probably would not have been good. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was excited to be here. It, it continues. It's not been good, but I was excited. Um, the title of my paper is called The Struggle Continues, Bertha Maxwell Roddy's Educational Activism, Reconfiguring Civil Rights and Black Power, in the desegregated South, 1969 to 1986. And this is a work in project, progress of a new project. I'm looking at post-desegregation ed educator activists um, after the civil rights movement, what were black teachers and black educators doing to try to save the children, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this paper begins on February 7th, 1969. Benjamin Chavis, TJ Reddy, and a small cadre of African-American students at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, UNCC, brazenly lowered the United States flag and raised the red, black, and green black liberation flag to commemorate the one-year anniversary of the Orangeburg, South Carolina massacre and to protest the failure of the university to approve a black student union. After no response, the protesters then presented a list of 10 demands 
based on the 10-point program of the Black Panthers to the administration that included the creation of a Black Studies program. Okay. In 1971, the, the Black Studies Committee, after they decided to have a committee, um, turned to UNC Charlotte Human Development Assistant Professor Bertha Maxwell. That's after three attempts to hire a male professor. I don't have that in my paper, though. Um, later, Maxwell writing through marriage to direct the program. One of her past employers, William Self, the superintendent of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Public Schools warned the committee, quote, if you want black studies, then hire her. If you don't want black studies, you better not hire her because she's going to get it, end quote. <laughs> Maxwell Roddy embraced the challenge of creating a black studies program as well as institutionalizing it as a field of inquiry. By 1975, she had become the founding chairperson of the National Council of Black Studies, and NCBS members credit her with being the, quote, mother of the black studies movement, end quote. While she is not as well known as other pioneers of black studies, recognizing how early administrators developed programs is key to understanding the institutionalization of black studies in the academy. Although black student protests led to the creations of black studies, it took directors such as Maxwell Roddy to ensure its existence. Her impact extended well beyond her academic program. Concerned with retention of black students, she instituted the first black freshman orientation and held student encounter sessions at the school. After establishing the Afro-American and African Studies BA in 1976 and leading the program to department status in 1984, she retired as the Frank Porter Graham Professor Emeritus of Africana Studies in 1986. This presentation analyzes the actions of a woman whose efforts as the first black person to get a master's degree in educational administration at UNC Greensboro in 1966, as the first black woman principal of a white elementary school in Charlotte in 1969, and as co-founder of Charlotte's Afro-American Cultural Center in 1974, enable us to reevaluate the role of the anti-discrimination educator slash reformer in a desegregated environment. While Maxwell Roddy claims that, quote, she never sought out to be a leader, end quote, she excelled as one. As an educator, community activist, and national leader, she successfully navigated through and around boundaries of racism, sexism, and class conflict to develop some, a familial leadership style, create powerful coalitions, and build lasting programs and institutions in education and the arts. By looking at her multi-layered and multifaceted career, we can better understand how black women activists have influenced and transformed the intellectual and activist landscapes of civil rights, black power, and feminism in the urban South. Maxwell Roddy grew up in the Piedmont area of South Carolina during the era of segregation. Born Bertha Lyons in 1931, she spent her childhood in Seneca, South Carolina. Her mother was a domestic worker and her father was a laborer in a locally known herbalist healer. After working to save money, Bertha Maxwell Roddy enrolled in Johnson C. Smith University in Charlotte. As an undergraduate, she pledged Delta Sigma Theta, a public service sorority. She would later become the 20th national president of the organization of more than 700,000 women from 1992 to 1996. <coughs> After graduating from college in 1954, she started teaching fourth through sixth grades at Alexander Elementary, a segregated school in Charlotte's first ward. By the late 60s, Charlotte's public schools were being embroiled in controversy as the Swan versus Mecklenburg County decision ruled that busing could be used to foster school desegregation. While many of Charlotte's black teachers, such as Maxwell Roddy, endorsed and participated in desegregation efforts, it often came at a heavy price. One of the most negative consequences was the firing and displacement of African American teachers and principals. While Maxwell Roddy's school would be closed, she refused to be demoted, as she was, uh, had rose to be a principal by this time. She claims, quote, I refuse to go to anybody's white school and be somebody's assistant. I earned my degree at UNC Greensboro, end quote. Instead, from her activism, she was appointed the first black woman principal of all white elementary school in Charlotte. Quote, being first is not important to me, she asserts. This was an opportunity for me to see that every child was able to fulfill his or her potential. Well, while she was told, she decided um, in the late, after being promoted, she was um, the principal of Albemarle Road Elementary School, which had a student population of one black child and 584 white children. Um, determined to make a difference at the school, she implemented several new methods, established a parent-teacher student association, and drew the attention of school officials from across the state. While she initiated new learning concepts, 
she still encountered old ideas of racism and sexism. Parents were often shocked when they discovered that the principal of their child's school was a woman and black as well. Mm -hmm. After two years of struggle, she grew very frustrated. She said, quote, it was like putting a diaper on a gnat, unquote. <laughs> <laughs> she, decided, she decided to join the faculty of the Human Development and Learning Department at UNC Charlotte. Ma Baxter Roddy did not conform to the idealized images of black power, the, of the powerful masculine African-American male in leather or military fatigue, or the strong young female armed Afro-wearing activist who stood by her man and her babies for the black nation. Yet she embraced the concept of political, social, and cultural self-determination. Her experiences were promoting a positive black-centered identity were formed as a public school teacher and principal. In moving from the public schools to a university setting, she merged foundational philosophies of educational uplift she learned as a teacher with new powerful ideas of cultural nationalism to promote a vision of a powerful black community that extended from the playground to the college campus. While scholars debate, the, um, and, oh, we can move up, sorry. When Maxwell Roddy joined the UNC faculty as an assistant professor in 1970, she came to help train teachers, quote, I did not go to UNCC to do anything in black studies. I just desegregated the Charlotte Mecklenburg schools, end quote. Ironically, as a disillusioned Maxwell Roddy left the CMS schools and his efforts to desegregate, just as black studies, as the black studies movement began to emerge across the nation's colleges and universities. Historian Penel Joseph argues, quote, that black studies programs remain one of the most enduring and outstanding legacies of the black power movement, end quote. As a teacher at the university, and as later as black studies director, she encountered skepticism by some of the student activists. Quote, they thought I was a handkerchief head nigger, but I told them that I have something that you all don't have. I have the skills to run this program. <laughs> 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 The students mistakenly thought that Maxwell Roddy, as a former public school teacher, held the views of the black pro-integration establishment who criticized the concepts of black nationalism. Despite their mis misguided perceptions, Maxwell Roddy, an experienced leader and administrator, dil diligently worked to create an academically sound program, establish a black studies library, and consistently challenged university officials to hire more black professors and provide more funding. Uh, okay. Well, she talks about creating this um, program of black mindfulness. I'm gonna skip, and she um, talks about um, having this kind of familial, familial office. Um, but let me get to what the black studies thing before I get out of time. Um, in 1975, she was creating a black studies major, but she had nowhere to get it accredited, and the administration says you have to have this accredited. So she created this um, uh, North Carolina conference, and then she decided there needs to be a national one. So she called all these black studies directors together. Um, it was um, Malinga, Karina, all, all the big shots, all the names we know. So they all got together and they were all, she argues, they were all arguing and talking about their pan-Africanism. And she's like, okay, let's work. Let's get down to work. So she helped establish this idea and eventually became the uh, National Council of Black Studies. She was this first chairperson for two years. She was a behind the scenes role, but she glued everybody together. Um, and so that was one of her things. She doesn't get a lot of credit for that, um, but she was the, co the founder of the National Council of Black Studies. Um, one thing, if one would describe um, Maxwell Roddy, the email, I'm gonna skip that, make sure we have that. Um, okay. But while she was successful in establishing a strong program that met university goals and criteria, she was first and foremost an educator. And this focus and her, her work reflects the turning point in the development of black studies as you have the community activists, administrators, kind of countering the scholarly the you know, theories and all these kind of ideas. And so the activist educator sometimes gets dim diminished in that kind of thing. Um, but also I wanted to talk about, just kind of as a close, um, Maxwell Roddy's story critically exposes the continuing impact of the civil rights movement and the influence of black power by revealing the ways in which black women activists both celebrated the gains of the civil rights movement while also attempting to remedy the loss of community and identity often brought by desegregation. Her actors as an academic and community mother also shed light upon the efforts of other African-American women activists fighting in their university school 
on school boards and in their communities to improve black children's lives as, na as the nation's se sentiment turned away from alleviating poverty, school segregation, and discrimination in after the 1970s. And um, Maxwell Roddy did retire in 1986, but she continued on. She ran for the North Carolina State Assembly. She became the national president of Delta Sigma Theta. So she was a large name, and she created the Afro-American Cultural Center, which is now the Harvey Gantt Center for the Arts. It's an $18 million facility. So she was very active in the, sh in the community as well. She created the Ab Cultural Center because she saw of er the effect of urban renewal and the closing of black schools that black students would have no cultural landmarks that were African American. American anymore. So that is why everything she did had a foundation of education, but she was also an activist. Um, she also, um, when she also still teaches, she's in her 80s, um, and she used to close all of her letters with her orientation book with this phrase, a luta continua, the struggle continues. So she started a debutante ball, but she was a nationalist. <laughs> 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 so, as everyone has already said, I just want to say how happy I am to be here and um, to thank the people that put this conference together. And, um, one benefit of being on this large panel is that I read everyone's papers, and so Dr. Perkins was going to talk about the Howard women. I took them out. <laughs> <laughs> so I can come back to them at the end if I need to. But um, this is really a work in progress. I mean, I literally will leave here and go finish some work in the Howard Archives, and I'm in the midst of still interviewing women who have made their careers and really are ending their careers at black colleges. Uh, and so I'll start out with two quotes. Um, one is from Merz Tate, who, who Dr. Perkins referenced, and this is in a letter that she's writing to the, to the dean in 1973. So she says, as a woman professor at Howard University, I have suffered deep humiliation about which you are unaware and I shall not describe and great financial loss. And the second quote is from Rosalind Turborg, Pre Rosalind Turborg Penn, who is Professor Emerita at Morgan State University. And she says about her experiences teaching at a black college, the idea was, this is your contribution, your service to the race. And I believe that. I mean, they got me believing that. And I still do. It is service to the race. And I think this really touches upon some of the experiences of black women who were teaching at and made their careers at black colleges. So many of us are at least familiar with the founders, women who started schools with little more than nickels and dimes, women like Lucy Laney and Mary McLeod Bethune, Nanny Helen Burroughs and Charlotte Hawkins Brown. But much less is known about the women whose names we find in all of the black college catalogs. A look at black women's ex work and experiences across time and at different institutions is critical to 21st century efforts at understanding and addressing continuing gender disparities at black colleges. And I can talk about some of the things that are going on presently that make it difficult to discuss and research this. So, um, so this piece that I'm presenting today is part of a larger piece that begins with black women faculty in the late 19th century. Uh, and I start out by looking at what happens as black colleges transition from white to black administrations mm -hmm. and find that much stays the same for black women on college campuses. And then I go all the way kind of through the really the 1990s. So as this change took place, meaning as the change took place from white to black administrators on black college campuses, educated black women reminded men that these colleges were supposed to benefit both sexes. For instance, in 1886, Anna J. Cooper admonished a room full of black Episcopalian priests for neglecting the educational needs of women. Cooper complained that their main college, which is St. Augustine in North Carolina, had graduated only five women since, it, since its founding in 1868. Cooper lamented the fact that while, quote, numerous young men have been kept and trained for the ministry by the charities of the church, the number of indigent females who have been supported, sheltered, and trained is phenomenally small, unquote, end quote. She contended that the church viewed the education of girls as secondary and was possible only if girls could pay their own way 
and accommodate themselves to, quote, the plans mapped out for the training of the other sex, end quote. Cop Cooper challenged the black clergyman, clergyman to make I am my sister's keeper their charge, arguing that it was unchristian not to do so. So the strategy of the late 19th century of basing arguments for citizenship rights on black men's patriarchal obligations shaped the way that black schools socialized female students and teachers and restricted women's opportunities for advancement in all black enterprises at the turn of the 20th century. A few of the women from that period left behind records that would provide insight into their experiences as faculty and staff. Nevertheless, as increased numbers of black women obtained college degrees during the 20th century, they began, they began to carve out spheres of influence on the black college campus. As their numbers increased, we are better able to discern some of the issues that they faced. Women used the position of dean of women to professionalize their work at black schools and to move beyond the role of matron to which many of them had earlier been relegated. This transition was not an easy one, however. The experiences of Lucy Diggs Slow, who was, um, as Dr. Perkins referenced, the first black woman dean at Howard University, reflect the difficulties that women of color faced as they tried to break the glass ceiling at institutions run by black men. And here's where I was going to talk about slow, but I took her out. <laughs> so, um, but she had this, and I really rely a lot on, on Linda's work. She had this very contentious, she started out as dean of women and the president was white and she was kind of on his council of deans and they get the first black president at Howard and you would think that maybe you know she's gonna have a bigger space on the campus but in fact they actually have this very contentious relationship that really only ends with her death. Um, but in the meantime she has become president of this National Association of College Women which is made up of black women and they've started to do research about um, the experiences of black women students and faculty and staff at other black colleges and they're finding that they're not represented in um, student activities and decision making, things of that nature. So despite the work uh, begun by Slo and her associates in the National Association of College Women during the 1920s, black women of the Depression and World War II eras were still trying to negotiate equitable treatment on black college campuses. The award-winning author of the novel Jubilee, Margaret Walker, spent her entire teaching career at black colleges. And her experiences between the 1930s and late 1970s reflect the perils and promise for African-American women faculty. As for myself, Walker recalled, my teaching career has been fraught with conflict, insults, humiliations, and disappointments. In every case where I have attempted to make a creative contribution and succeeded, I have immediately been replaced by a man. Walker's career began at Livingstone College where she lived in the girls' dormitory and was required to rise with the students at six o'clock in the morning. At Livingstone, she recalled, quote, my life was arranged for me hour after hour and controlled by a half dozen people. Had I been a man, Walker proclaimed, no one would have dared treat me like, treat me like that. Walker continued to encounter difficulties at Jackson State in Mississippi, where she spent the remainder of her career. Her first year at Jackson, she taught five classes, in addition to a Saturday class that served in-service teachers. At the end of her first year, Jackson recalled, quote, I never worked so hard in my life, end quote. But happily, she was rewarded by the president with a $200 raise. At Jackson, during her early years, it appears that she worked very hard and she was rewarded each year with an increase in her salary. And this maintained until the birth of her third and fourth children. So when she found out she was pregnant with her third child, a friend at the university warned her not to say anything because her contract would not be renewed for the next year if the president found out. So she doesn't say anything and she gets the contract. She ends up having a baby. Um, by the Fourth, when she has her, after her fourth child, Walker asserted that the president was so upset that he began reducing her annual salary increases to $100 a year over the course of seven years. But mind you, she's really the most well-known person in the English department because she's won this award from Yale and, um, and so she brings them a great deal of acclaim. So she says, I understood. I got the message loud and clear. 
Walker, who was under considerable financial strain with a growing family, could ill afford to take a year of unpaid leave from work. Her relationship with the president seemingly never recovered. While she was on leave studying for her PhD at Iowa State, the president tried to replace her with a man who already had his PhD. Um, by this time, though, she has tenure. <laughs> so they, they can't fire her, they just try to pressure her to quit, which she won't do. So after obtaining her PhD in 1965, Walker considered leaving Jackson State, and she certainly could have um, found another position. She'd had a, a white professor who was a mentor who asked her to consider leaving. Um, but she chose to stay at Jackson where, quote, she knew she was needed, end quote. Despite her ongoing battles with President Reddix, Walker continued to do the work at Jackson State that she believed to be important. Her dissertation became the award-winning book, Jubilee. Although Walker recalled that men often got the credit and pay for her work, as when she established a freshman writing program only to see it handed over, a man, over to a man, she left her mark on the university with the establishment of the Institute for the Study of the History, Life, and Culture of Black People. After President Reddix retired, the new president raised her salary by $2,000 within his first year, and in 1968, Walker established the aforementioned institute. She would run the institute until her retirement in 1979. So what I did was I started to see that, I'm almost out of time, that, um, that there, a lot of the women, for instance, even at Howard, they lead their papers, they may or may not talk about how gender influence or, you know, their experiences there. So I started college in the words of one, quote, you never have to prove that being and studying blackness is good, end quote. <laughs> Although not always the case, in fact, Margaret Walker, who talked about all the difficulties she had, um, in a speech may have clarified the feelings of many other African-American women faculty when she declared, quote, the black woman on the black college campus can be anything she wants to be, end quote. Thank you to uh, you all. Um, before we open it up to the uh, floor, are there any issues you want to take up with each other? Or I have a couple things, just a footnote on to what Stephanie did. It's a really great paper, and I learned a lot. But it's, the person who said it's easy to do black, it really wasn't in a lot of places uh, to, to do black. I remember Ruth Simmons saying, going to Spelman, it was easy to get black studies at Princeton. Mm -hmm. oh. That it wasn't Spelman. You know, there was so much resistance to studying I don't even black. get into that. Right. Okay. Black people <laughs> right. in this paper. Right. But I can comment on that and say that as a student, at Spelman in the 90s, you could graduate without taking anything on um, black people. Yeah, same at Morehouse. Yeah. So it wasn't until, and this was after I finished my mandatory courses, that they instituted this course on the African diaspora. Mm -hmm. So I definitely think that there was resistance. I was just going to say, too, and I think this is an issue not just for this panel, but for the conference as a whole, but what these papers are making me think about is, is that if we're going to think about intellectual history broadly, you know, so that we're not just in terms of ideas that are written down, um, but also how ideas emerge and circulate in many formats, or how um, how disciplines and canons are shaped, or the politics of editorial work, which we talked about a couple of days ago, or the building of infrastructure, if we're gonna talk about all of that as being intellectual work, then we have to figure out how to document that kind of practice. And so I think, you know, Dr. Ramsey's work on Bertha Maxwell Roddy is a case in point. How do you document the ideas of someone whose primary form of writing was no doubt on a day-to-day -day basis administrative, um, but who helped build a department and indeed a discipline? How do you, how do you document that? And it seems to me that figures like, like Maxwell Roddy or Vivian Harsh, um, can sometimes elicit a skepticism as if, you know, we require some kind of justification or uh, um, credentializing uh, to put them into a pantheon of intellectuals. But what I'm certainly thinking about at this conference is that, you know, perhaps it's not they who require any justification, um, but us who need to find more creative modes of, of recovery. Um, you know, maybe it's our own reliance on the convenience of certain kinds of written text that, that we need to rework. So we have a uh, question.
and she says that we shouldn't have to, good videographers are always going to appear in the black uh, folks autobiography, but then this is when you're going to think about what kinds of things they can express to this. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if this is an extension of that kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. That's my question for you. Uh, the question is, um, I'm wondering, there's a book that recently came out called In Search of the Talent of Tennis. Mm -hmm. It's all about black male tennis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Definitely, and I was just recently talking to Beverly Guy Sheftall, I don't know if you all know her at Spelman, um, and we were just talking about she, you know, we're thinking about planning, you know, maybe you all can help, a, a, a conference on the history of black women in black colleges. I mean, now more and more people are looking at, I mean, because it's just so necessary, and I'm just convinced the more and more I, you do these oral histories and you talk to people, and I mean, I'm talking about women who literally dedicated their lives when they could have moved on. When I look at these guys at, at Howard who did leave, you know, and, and moved on to other places when they had that opportunity. Uh, and I'm looking at one person like Annabeth Lindsay who became the dean of the School of Social Work by default, she said, because no man, they couldn't find a man. Um, and even when she was offered money to work with the government and all these other guys left and worked for the federal government, the Urban League, and all these other places. She stayed, you know, just because she felt so committed to those students and to the institution. And you see that over again. But anyway, the point Beverly was making, because we were just talking, because we were the same core, you know, age group, we were talking about retirement, and she was just saying how, and I never even thought about this, how little black colleges put in your retirement. And she said people who spent their lives in black colleges have very little in retirement, you know, so it's just not the same. Because she was saying, you know, other institutions match and give a lot more. And so the, the, the sacrifice has just been enormous in terms of financial. And I just finished interviewing a woman who taught, for because I'm also looking at Fisk uh, in depth, and who had taught at Fisk for 41 years. And she was saying, and Fisk was actually good in the, in the long run compared to a lot of other schools, but she had been at Bennett. And, and she was just talking about black, how overworked you're on a black college campus. And she was saying, and you know, of course, this is the old days. She was saying nobody even heard of AAUP and all of that stuff. She said, do you know anything about how many classes you're supposed to take and all these things about, you know, like nobody, she said, you're so happy to have a job, you know, that if they tell you to teach eight classes, that's what you taught. You know, and you just say, oh, well, this is against the rules. You're not supposed to have that many. You know, she said credit hours, how many credit hours you're supposed. She said that was just not even anything discussed. That changed over time. But, you know, what, you know, and of course, talking to women who did have to live in the dorms. Um, I interviewed this woman who had been in Tuskegee who lasted one year, because she was from the North, too. So she wasn't used to even being in the South. And she was saying they were locking people up and telling her you couldn't have these airmen visiting you in your, you know, what? You know, and so she was like, <laughs> <laughs> she was like, I'm out of here. So she went back. No, she said no, you know. She was just saying, you know, it was really interesting talking to these older women about their experiences. And she was like, you know, I went to Michigan. We couldn't even live on campus. You know, and she was just saying, I've been, you know, since 16, I was out and free. And then you get down to Tuskegee and how they locked you up and, you know, and all of these rules and telling you who could visit you and at what time. She said, no. <laughs> Bibliography seemed tame in comparison to these <laughs> stories, right? right. Um, but thank you for, for um, bringing up Car Carla Holloway's work. I mean, I think there, there are some precedents for thinking about uh, black bibliography, and I think Betty Kaplan Gubert's um, edited volume, Early Black Bibliographies, is really incredible and um, not studied enough, but she compiles a lot of the really early um, and hard to find bibliographies of you know, Du Bois from the Atlanta University Studies and um, Daniel Murray, who was at the Library of Congress, and Roger Adger, uh, Schomburg, and others. Um, and so I think uh, she doesn't herself provide a lot of commentary about them, but because she's brought them together, it gives, it gives us an opportunity to do comparative bibliography. Um, and so, you know, what I'm trying to do is, 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 in some sense, build on that and look at some of the, the later bibliographies, like the ones that Harsh put together, and, and of course, Dorothy Porter, and, and so on. Just turned around, yes. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay. So when I say work in progress, I really mean work in progress. <laughs> so what I did when, because this is coming out of a manuscript, but it's not going. This part won't be in the manuscript. Um, I really did it based upon what was available in Black College archives. Mm. And so, and that's a whole nother discussion. Yeah. I saw the person from Tuskegee. I was like, I never could get in there. Nobody ever called me back. Right. But anyway, <laughs> um, so it was not, <laughs> it, so it wasn't a scientific, it was literally like, oh, where could I roll up and say, can I get in here if I can get a return phone call or return email? Um, and then in terms of the interviews, what I did was I started with Rosalind Turborg Penn, and then she's helped me to identify other people. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to, instead of, so I want to have a mix of public, private mm -hmm. schools, and um, a mix of disciplines. Because the thing that was interesting to me is that I had mostly historians, because I'm a historian and so is she. And, but when I interviewed the people who were not in history, um, for them, they just don't see, they did have not so far seen sex discrimination as an issue. It's just very interesting to see people who are in a different discipline. So in terms of my methodology, I'm working on how I make sure that um, I have a cross um, group for interviewees, but for the archives, I'm doing it based upon what's available. <laughs> Speak up for the honor of Tuskegee. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you know what? She's probably in my on my list. I have to, but she's she's not a part of the oral history. That okay. very rich, I mean, in terms of the people on the faculty there. Yes. It's, it's difficult to define, and that's why I put together um, the, the pictorial list. I had to figure out how to uh, classify these women. And I'm, I, I define myself as a structuralist. I feel, I feel paralyzed if I can't have a map, and that's because I was an Air Force brat, so I've traveled a lot, and that's really impacted the way that I see scholarship in that I've got to find out, you know, my, the methodology is very, very important to me. So for this study, after I got the, 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 the larger picture, I just focused on those who um, wrote in their autobiographies about study abroad. Now that has changed over time and that Mary Church Terrell didn't take a formal, she did not go over there to take a formal class. 
she was only you know afforded the opportunity to go take to go for what was supposed to be one year but she stretched into two years because she was money her situation was very different from Anna Julia Cooper though they both graduated from Oberlin in 1884 and and, and 1888 but their circumstances were very different. So I've had to be very flexible with my definitions. And even in that uh, list of 130, Jan Willis is an interesting case because she went over there to study abroad. She went over to Tibet and Nepal to study in a formal study abroad program. But the way that I've classified the four reasons that African Americans have studied abroad, uh, religion, politics, education, and culture, Obviously, with categorization, you have to admit that the, you know, there's no neat category because even though she went over to study abroad, she I really see her as someone who was on a religious mission who can then be contrasted with Malcolm X in a really interesting way. Oh, you're talking about Alice Coltrane. I just want to make sure. Alice Coltrane? Alice Coltrane. Did her, 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 Alice Coltrane had her study in, in India. Did she write an autobiography? No. And that, so this is, the, the methodology question for me is huge. I have to delineate and, and, and to say that is not within the scope of my study because I'm looking at autobiographies. And this comes from John Bracey, who was my dissertation advisor, who when I initially started writing on African American women in higher education, you know, I said, well, I'm writing on Cooper and I think I named Audre Lorde and Angela Davis and a couple of other people. And he said, so what is your methodology? And I said, well, these are the women that speak to me. <laughs> and he said, speak to me is not a methodology. So I, <laughs> you know, so I had to come up with a criteria. And for those of you, you know, I know some of you have, have the book. For the way that I came down to the four women from my dissertation and the two women from the book is the Encyclopedia of Black Women, which is invaluable. They have an index in the back. There was 114 women in the index that were listed as educators by vocation. That allowed me to not consider Mary Church Terrell because she taught, but she was not an educator by vocation. Ida B. Wells taught, but was not an educator by vocation. So it's those types of scientific approaches to uh, creating a viable scope that will allow you, I think, to have a certain type of freedom that is, is necessary to be able to track some of those things. So, so I'm beginning this new study in the same way that I began the old study, which is to very clearly, because there are wonderful collections of autobiographies, there's uh, travel writings, um, you know, uh, the Elaine Lee Go Girl, which in some cases is problematic. Um, but if, you, if you're not clear about your methodology and how you define your scope, th and then you get into, you know, there's ultimately problems with all sorts of definitions anyway, but you get into murky ground. So these are African American women who wrote autobiographies who within their life narrative situate, because there are people like uh, I mentioned in the paper, Fleming Cottrell, mm -hmm. who was amazing mm -hmm. in her ability to study and not only you know, study in India, she created a school in India, mm -hmm. but she didn't write an autobiography. Mm -hmm. So it's not that she's not important, but for clarifying scope of exactly what I'm talking about, it's really helpful for me to make these, you know, these, um, these preliminary decisions that will allow me then to, you know, say that's not within the scope of my research, but to, you know, obviously acknowledge that I need to get that name because I don't know that person. So, yes. Sure. Just a follow up along that line you mentioned, Mr. Marcus. Um, I had a question that it was about the relationship between women and children as a class, and you talked a little bit about not only the relationships that are building as they travel globally, but then how they talk and reflect about those through the autobiography. Oh, the first thing that comes to mind is, again, the difference between um, Dunham and, uh, and, and Zora Neale Hurston. And then, again, this is the beginning of a study that I'm just looking at their reflections and portrayal of that. There's an article by Emory, I can't remember her first name, that really um, brings to, that really brought to light my understanding of how these two women experienced Haiti and Jamaica in a different way, in that she talks about they both interviewed this one um, white guy who was like the voodoo guy, right? And they had very different takes on him. Um, Zora Neale Hurston, in her, in her analysis, um, really was more the uh, signifier on him in her, in her interview. And, and Catherine Dunham was really kind of setting her, setting him as, uh, as a, a, a fall guy for her own 
uh, understanding of the, uh, the ritual, right, of her experience of initiation. And so that's just one example of how um, I'm thinking and I'm, I'm excited to learn about the, the way that they not only made those um, relationships, but how they portray them in their writing. But again, yeah, that's, that's the first thing that came to mind is how, if you again do these constellations, you can start to see the different relationships that people had um, with each other and that they made over the years. Yeah. Just to follow up, one interesting, if you read the first few letters, mm -hmm. the first few letters, um, in Homo Hood, we have Tim Corcoran that you know, I'm not one of those people who allows them to, I, I pay them to perform for me. Mm -hmm. And I've been told that there was a researcher here who just paid them to perform for them. And this was during the letter that you're talking about Dunham. Yep. <laughs> so there is this. Oh, and this is. This is a great, <laughs> it's, it's absolutely necessary, but Bethune and Terrell and the letters that they write to each other. And I think the relationships that the women make abroad is interesting, but the relationships between the women is even more interesting. Absolutely. I, I mentioned I mentioned Cottrell and and I mentioned Cottrell in, in my paper mm -hmm. as as mm -hmm. a, this is the limitation of the approach that I'm taking yeah. because you miss incredible people like Cottrell. Mm -hmm. But I, I, and I will just add that there's a great deal of writing on international black internationalism now, and there's a way in which this can actually comment on that because much of that writing is about black men and travel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true, sir. Uh, I, I think I, Tara, and then you. I didn't hear the first part of what you said. You said you were looking at somebody at this? Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I guess it's just really situational in terms of where these women land up and at the point in time that they were there. Um, but one of the things, again, I said black colleges, despite the many ills it did present, I mean it did, one of the things I'm arguing that when you really, despite all of this, if you look at black colleges, you know, black people overwhelmingly believed in co-education. They believed in educating boys and girls. And even the early colleges that were single sex, they were basically founded for blacks by whites. You know, it wasn't that black people founded them. Uh, and, and, and many times there was this uh, push to merge Spelman and Morehouse, which I mean, which it never did, uh, obviously. But um, yeah, black women could find jobs on these I mean, even black women taught at, at, at Morehouse, you know, which would never happen. I mean, like somebody said, I mean, even white women's colleges gave preference in large part except for Wellesley to men faculty. Oh, after, because they felt like men added more prestige to the faculty. So it was hard for them to even get jobs even on a woman's college campus. Whereas you don't find that in a lot. I mean, because we, black women were needed, you know, and as black colleges grew and as accreditation became more important, Anybody with a PhD could find, could get a job. You may not be, you know, a lot of people didn't want to go to the rural South. I mean, a lot of people didn't want to go to Tuskegee or Talladega and these, you know, backwater towns. I'm sorry. I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm from, they didn't. You know? I mean, 
I'm sorry. They didn't. Uh, Professor Perkins, you're going to get me to close oh, up this. this oh, I'm stuff. sorry. Yeah, I mean, no, I'm just <laughs> telling you what they told me. I'm okay. Not. Right, right. Right, right. Um, Beautiful world. I just don't want to be disrespectful okay. to the next panel. Mm -hmm. That's the end. So just briefly. Yeah, I'll give uh, Deborah my record. Um, I have two, two comments. One, I want to push you on this notion that somehow looking at black school and kind of misery that mm -hmm. women mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is somehow better than the misery at an all white school. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's different. <laughs> I don't think <too. laughs> Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I, I just would like to just to run that out there. And then just the second comment is that I, I'm going to do an unabashed plug for telling the truth mm -hmm. of black women. And I mm -hmm. just want to mm -hmm. bring some of this up to the very present day. There are 17 memoirs of African-American women historians uh, who people who are still in the academy today who are telling about their lives in the academy, how they survived and how they are still surviving. No, I agree. Actually, I reviewed that book. Um, um, you're right. I mean, at least black women and black cotton, they weren't isolated. You know, they had friendships, and you know, and they talk about, uh, you know, I mean, and I, they, you know, I, this woman I told you who taught at Fisk for 41 years, she talked about all of the wonderful musicals they had, and you know, all of the stuff that they did on campus, and you don't think you don't think they had. I'm, I'm you gonna, think I'm going to suggest that you two have a. Uh, okay. that we <laughs> that's what you <laughs> said. Take it outside. <laughs> no, just I. I really think that we just want the other panel. Yeah, to yeah, right. To start. Right. 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 Right